Thank you. I think it's, we are slightly late. Uh, sorry for the delay. Um, my name is Manfred Honung, and uh, I'm the director of the Heinrich Böll Foundation Southeast Asia office in Bangkok. So uh, today I'd uh, first like to thank actually the International Literature Festival in Berlin uh, for their kind cooperation in making this event possible because both of our guests here are also guests of the International Literature Festival in Berlin. Um, we have actually today the pleasure uh, to host uh, two distinguished guests um, and have a discussion with them an exchange, uh, I hope, about the political, social, and cultural developments in their respective countries in, uh, in uh, Malaysia and in Thailand. Um, let me first introduce you the person to my left, Bernice Charlie. Bernice uh, is um, an award-winning writer and author of, I think, of six books by now. Yeah, the last being uh, Once We Were There, 2017, highly recommended. Please read it. It's a, a book about uh, the Reformasi period between, I think, 1998 to 2004, the time frame uh, in Malaysia. Um, um, Bernice is actually originating from um, Georgetown in Penang. Um, and uh, she read uh, education literature in Canada, I think, as a government uh, scholar, she, if under government scholarship, no? That was at the time. Um, she is uh, also the director of the Georgetown uh, Literature Festival since 2011. And um, you're also teaching at the uh, University of Nottingham campus in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Did I miss out on anything? Uh, that's great. Um, to my right is um, Prabhda Yoon. Prabhda Yoon, also an award-winning writer. You're a kind of a man of many talents. You're also a screenwriter. I think we had, um, in 2014, the Thai filmmaker Pen Ek here. And I think you wrote uh, two scripts for, for his films as well. Uh, you're a graphic designer, a translator, uh, so, uh, rightfully, you're a man of many talents, to be, <laughs> to be called that. Um, so, um, you have uh, now available of, in English language, I think are now, by now, two novels of yours. Uh, short stories, so short stories, you call it The Sad Part Wars and uh, Moving Parts. And you just published a new novel in English called Basement Moon, in Thai, sorry, in Thai, um, which is an interesting story, placed in the year 2069, and uh, at that time, uh, in your novel and piece, the military government is still in power in Thailand at the time, so probably a depressing piece uh, to read, but uh, strongly recommended. Okay, um, actually, um, the fact that uh, we have both here um, is, is uh, great insofar as um, we have them here as artists, writers, and uh, also citizens of their respective country, so that they are not here as um, political commentators or observers who look from outside uh, onto the political issues, but they're really part of these developments in their respective countries, and they work on it uh, as artists <coughs> and uh, literature persons. So I hope that we can have a broad discussion also on not only the politics of things and developments in your countries, but also about culture, social issues, and the history of it. And I assume that um, not many uh, in the room are familiar with the situation in the respective countries, so I, I would like to open and, and give the floor to, to you to um, give us a little input into the latest developments. Let me just give you some, some points I would like to start with. To give you an idea, and I'd like to start with Bernice. So on the 9th of May uh, of this year, uh, in Malaysia, an event happened, what many commentators was in the country called a revolution. They call it a watershed event. They call it the Malaysian tsunami. After almost or 61 years in power, the ruling Barisan National Coalition was washed away in an election that was peaceful and that uh, was in very many ways decisive. And I would like to ask you, um, Bernice, whether you can give us um, a little run through through the events that actually led to this 
Malaysian tsunami, if you like, and what were the most important parameters, how you describe the social, the political, and also the economic background that led to this kind of peaceful change in government after 61 years? Um, guten Abend. Thank you so much to the Heinrich Böll Foundation for inviting me to Berlin um, for the very first time. It's an honor to be here with Prabda. Um, many things led up to the 9th of May, but I think um, what was clearly um, an issue that, that sort of you know, made Malaysians of every race, color, creed, class very angry was um, the then Prime Minister Najib Razak and his, his wife, Rosma, and how they were driving the country to ruin. Um, he ruled for 10 years. He was not elected. Um, he was Abdullah Badawi's um, deputy prime minister who assumed the prime ministership in, in 2008. And in the last 10 years has basically led the country to almost financial ruin. If, uh, if Mahathir had not become the prime minister and, and if the Barisan National had not lost, we would have become a banana republic. Um, Malaysia is a very complicated place. It's, uh, it's made up of many, many races, many religions, um, the Muslims and the Malays being the major majority. Um, it, it states that we are a secular nation, but there are powers that want it to be an Islamic state. And in the last four months, since the 9th of May, we have seen that this is one of the agendas of the new Pakatan Harakpan government. Um, Anwar Ibrahim, who was imprisoned by Mahathir Mohamad, the dictatorial prime minister who ruled for 22 years, who took Malaysia to a certain kind of height with the Petronas Twin Towers, with the Commonwealth Games, with the building of you know, um, huge um, segments of, of infrastructure in Malaysia, but who also was, was, was very authoritarian, who silenced free speech, um, imprisoned many, many of his, of, his, uh, critics, uh, of his critics. And this is the man to now rescue us. Um, this 93-year-old man is now our prime minister. Uh, Anwar Ibrahim is again a free man. He was in prison twice. So it's a, it's a bizarre twist of, of, of fates. It's um, historic in the sense that many of us of my generation never thought we would ever see this change. We thought it would take at least another two, another two generations. But the events that led up to the 9th of May were essentially the fact that we were fed up. We just did not want this corrupt government anymore, who was leeching off its people, who was stealing blatantly from us um, you know, billions of, of dollars, who bought penthouses in New York and LA financed a Hollywood film called The Wolf of Wall Street, um, yachts, um, jewels of, of all kinds, tiaras. Um, it was obscene, it became obscene. And I think as, as Malaysians, we became ashamed. We were ashamed of who we were. Um, so the lead up to the 9th of May, of course, the ruling party has had many devices, very sneaky devices of, of not allowing people to vote. So there was a global effort, young people getting their ballots to airports, speaking to strangers, pilots offering to take their votes. In what, in, you know, it was, it was a miracle. We achieved through the rule of law, through the democratic right to vote, a bloodless revolution. And it's something that I'm very, very proud of. But in the last four months, we have seen this slip sliding very, very slowly. Two weeks ago, two women were caned publicly in Malaysia for attempting to have lesbian sex. Um, I'm worried again. So you were saying basically that the main reason was this obscene corruption by Najib um, that uh, kind of... Uh, triggered a certain pride in people to say this is not the nation we are and from looking from the outside one could really see with the killings that this was a government different from the Mahathi one with blood on its hands but were there also other reasons you think if you think of religion race uh the, the divisiveness of the of the Najib government other factors apart from corruption that played a role in this kind of sea change or... There are many, many issues, but I think at the end of the day, you know, Malaysians just wanted their country back. We just wanted the country to be what it, what it can be. And I think, you know, it's, it's incredible because I, it's, Malaysians have this incredible resilience. Um, we are forthright. 
uh, in, in many, many ways, but there's also a lot of fear. And I think it was also the fear of not being able to say what we really wanted to say. The fact that there were so many arbitrary um, arrests and you know we had we, we got rid of the Internal Security Act, but there, there is now a Sedition Act. There is a POTA Act, which is called Prevention of Terrorism Act. So there are all these acts that, that were enacted after you know, a promise of certain kinds of freedoms. Um, Najib once said, you are right, you can write, you have the freedom to write. I mean, that's complete and utter bullshit. You know, you can't write what you want to write. So it was just the, the sense of, of, we deserve better. We are better than this, we can do better than this. And for the first time, I think many people um, who had not voted, voted for the, for, for the first time. And there were movements um, around the world um, it was really quite extraordinary, you know, it, it's, it's so, there's so many factors, but at the end of the day, we all went to the polls, we voted for a government that, we voted against a government that we didn't want anymore. We just wanted, we, we wanted to, you know, almost like press, to, press a reset button. And I think that that's what the 9th of May was like. It was like a reset button. It was like Malaysia had come into its own. We believed in the vote and we voted. And... Um, you know, we didn't expect to win because I remember casting my vote, and of course, all of us were proudly showing off our, our inked fingers, um, you know, all over Facebook. Yes, I voted, I voted. And I remember sitting in a cafe with a friend of mine, and we were all rather glum. We were all saying, let's not expect anything, you know. But by seven o'clock that night, rumors were going around BN is gone. Even Saba and Sarawa, you know, were like, what? Really? This is, it, it's incredible. So for 48 hours, we were glued to our television sets. It's like, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? And for 48 hours, we were just completely on tenterhooks until Mahade was sworn in. It was like a, the entire country was holding its breath. Is this going to happen? Is Najib going to call the military? Is there going to be a state of emergency? So for 48 hours after the 9th of May, um, we, we were waiting and waiting and waiting in our, you know, it was that sense of, it was, it was that kind of feeling. And if you look at the, the figures, I think the Merica Center brought out these figures, the, the polling institute, saying that um, if you look actually at the changes, um, there were not so many in the rural parts and in the east coast of Malaysia. So 70% of the Malay Muslim population stuck to the Barisan Nacional and to pass. So, you know, there didn't seem that there, there wasn't this reflection of this change in the voter attitude of the of the Malay majority. So, how did actually this result come about? What actually made this change possible? Um, the rural Malays. I mean, PAS has a stronghold in Kelantan and Trengganu, and that will never change. Um, also in the north. Um, it's, it's really, a, you know, the battle between the rural Malays and the urban Malays. The urban Malays are largely educated, well-read, um, well-spoken, you know, forthright. It's been the, the tendency of the Najib government to create, you know, it's almost like keeping the Malays ignorant and stupid. We want to keep them that way so we can, you know, we, can, we have control over them. Um, Malaysia is, is a very fragmented very fractured society. In the last 10 years, our education system has deteriorated. There are, there are, it's, it's not the same kind of um, country that I went to when, when I you know, went to school in the 80s. There are racial divisions. The Malays stick to themselves, the Chinese stick to themselves, the Indians stick to themselves. There's a lot of racism in, that is endemic within the school system, within the education system, and in the government sector as well. Um, so it's very difficult to, to you know, it's, it's hard to just pinpoint numbers because I think at the end of the day, you know, we all came together. I mean, I'm speaking again specifically about the election um, to vote. But now we see that the issue is still about Islam. It is still about what it means to be Malay and Muslim and liberal or not. Um, we have in the last four months have become a country of complete contradiction, you know, in the, you know, where you have the public flogging of two women in a courtroom witnessed by 150 people to a minister of environment who is now finally concerned about climate change. We have a youth minister who's 25 years old who asks people to call him bro. You know, it's, it's just a country of complete contrast. Um, it's really bizarre and it's, it's a very strange time 
to be exhilarated, but, but fearful. So it's that combination of fear and exhilaration and the fact that we did a miracle that no other country has done without a drop of blood. We achieve that. But at the same time, this is happening. Anwar Ibrahim is waiting in the shadows to become prime minister. So. So let's talk about that, your hopes, your harapan for the future <laughs> in a minute. And uh, I turn to uh, Prabta. I think it, you would also like to have this kind of excitement in your society. Um, uh, and, it, we, you know, it's, it, it would be too easy, you know, to, to portray now Malaysia as the beacon of hope and also the example for ASEAN and how to do a, a government change peacefully uh, without a drop of blood being shed and then keeping the, the population now uh, very excited and discussing uh, issues of democracy, people's participation, so forth. Now, Thailand, after uh, four years now of uh, military government after the coup in uh, a very still a very difficult situation, although um, the government has announced ever and, and ever again that there will be elections coming soon. Nothing is happening and at the moment as we speak, actually the um, democratic space is shrinking, people get arrested, um, although now parties are, are being registered, uh, the exercise of, of liberties is to, uh, in, in my experience, becoming even more difficult. Um, if you had to describe this kind of situation, this this stagnation, this uh, constant um, return to coups, to rewritten constituencies, um, how would you describe that? I, I remember a word by a um, sentence by Andrew Walker, the um, Australian um, historian, who was basically saying, you know, that the tragedy of Thailand in the past year since the constitutional monarchy was uh, installed in 1932 was that the people were always taken back to square one. There has been political progress, democracy progressed, and then through a coup, people were pushed back to back to square one. And this is the tragedy of Thailand. So um, maybe we can take, get your input um, now on on the situation in Thailand as you see it. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, well, you cannot beat Thailand for contradictions and hypocrisy for sure. <laughs> um, we, we are under, uh, just to be on the same page, um, Thailand is under military rule um, since uh, 2014. And um, this is the 12th coup that we've had since 1932 when we became a constitutional monarchy. Um, so we like coups, it seems. Um, and it's true that uh, in, in many ways, we are still struggling um, for the same fight that happened years and years ago. And, but same with Malaysia, Thailand, the problems in Thailand are very complex. So it's, it's really not easy to talk about it all tonight or in a very limited time. I don't even really know it all. I don't really understand it all. So what I'm going to be talking about mostly tonight uh, is just my opinion. Um, somebody's um, from mostly an artistic background and somebody who is a liberal living in a highly nationalistic conservative country. Um, many people don't agree with what I feel or what I think in Thailand. Um, but the situation now basically is we're still in uncertainty about the future, even the near future, because the promised election date is uh, supposed to be February, some, somewhere in February in 2019. But just yesterday or this morning, I read um, news that the current prime minister, uh, Prayut Chan Osha, is expressing doubt uh, that people in Thailand understand democracy enough to vote. So that's a bad sign because he's already postponed uh, election four or five times already since he came into power. And every time, um, every time he does it is, is because of some kind of ex excuse like that. Um, that people don't understand, they're not ready, there's still conflicts within the country, um, that politicians are out there to cheat uh, to, or to um, 
lie to the people, and that basically Thai people are not fit for democracy, and that we need to prolong this uh, stability uh, that is given by the military, basically. So if this continues, it looks very not very promising that we will have an election soon. Um, all the signs are there that the military wants to be to to stay in power, um, and like all authoritarian regimes, uh, we are experiencing very strange um, situations. People get arrested for really strange reasons and excuses. Um, freedom of, of expression is limited. Um, it's not limited in the sense that we, it's, people aren't really afraid to talk in, in, in everyday life, but if uh, writers or, or public figures express their honest opinions about the military, um, then you could get in serious trouble. It's, it's still quite risky in that sense. From my uh, experience in the country, what I found very astounding is the fact, you know, that the authorities and so also the elites in Thailand still believe in the fact that um, this proclaimed system of harmony or reconciliation will create a solution for the country. I personally believe it's actually the, the root cause of the problem. I think that in, 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 you know, in Thai society, there needs to be education that people can deal with differences. This has been lacking for a long time. And I don't know whether you have other reasons to see that Thailand always ended up in this kind of eternal cycle of, of um, coups, which are nothing else but a symbol of a, a policy failure you know, to get the people to discuss their issues and find solutions, even if you have different opinions. Um. I was um, when when Bernice said that the, your the election in Malaysia felt like the uh, the victory felt like a reset. Um, in Thailand, it's sort of the opposite. Like people always want to reset things. So when somebody comes into power, uh, mostly the military, they will say we're here to reset, um, to to start the harmony again. We have this imagined idea that there was a time when Thailand was very peaceful and, um, and everybody was happy and there were no conflicts, which is not true. But every time somebody comes into power, they, they, they put on this image that they are there to, to, to bring back happiness. They even write songs about it. You know? So, um, yeah, so, so it's a very... Um, I don't know. I mean, I mean, it's um, f for me. What I, I feel that the problem is that democracy in Thailand was really always about um, the struggle of power within the elites. Um, so it's not. It has only been recently that uh, people, like the civilians, feel that they have any power. And this is also another contradiction because this feeling came. Um, with the rise of Thaksin Shinawat, who became a very popular prime minister, um, who was a billionaire tycoon. And he, but he did bring this kind of sentiments uh, amongst the common people, especially the very poor in, in the northeastern part of Thailand, which is a huge um, majority of, of the voters in, in Thailand. And in a way, the conflict now is really about that. It's about people who have sort of recognized their power, but still being oppressed by the old power, the old regimes, the old networks of power, um, mostly in Bangkok. So this, this um, you may have heard about the crackdown and um, you know, and the lives that were lost in 2010. Like more than 85 people were killed in the, a military crackdown of the of protesters who were pro Thaksin, um, so called red shirts. Um, and that, since then to now, that conflict is still going on, even though the government is trying to paint this picture that, that everything is now peaceful and, and dandy. But, but it's, it's really sort of brewing and, and it's going to burst again if nothing changes soon. And do you see 
an option that there would be a moment like there has been, we will talk about the consequences and uh, the other things later, but for Thailand that there would be an option to have a similar moment as it was yeah, but, the 9th of May. But what I'm afraid of is that we're going to be very happy for four months <laughs> <laughs> and, and then we're going to be like, oh no, it's the same thing, you know, <laughs> or worse. <laughs> You know, so I don't know. I was very interested to hear about Malaysia because when I, I felt it very strongly that there was a reaction um, for the victory, and because of I have some Malaysian friends in my Facebook um, account, and they are all celebrating on that day. They're like, wow, this is a revolution. This is, a... but then. You know, the guy is 93 years old, and I always feel a little bit skeptical about very old people who used to be in power for a long time. So there must be some kind of skepticism in that too, no? And Thailand is in that, you know, for some reason, old dictatorships die hard. They, they live very, very long. They must do something right because they live a very, very long time, very healthy people. <laughs> Um, we, we can learn from them in some ways. They should write books about health. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so it's, it's a similar problem because in a way, we would be very happy to get rid of the current situation. But what we replace it is also worrying. We don't really see a, an alternative that is, you know, the best case scenario for Thailand yet. Uh, we have some hopes for the younger generation who are trying to change things, people who express themselves very openly. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard to tell because you have to admit also that people who are um, privileged enough to, to express themselves are the educated um, elites. And they maybe don't really understand enough of the problems that are facing among the common people or the poor, uh, who are really the most important um, sector that needs to be you know, improved. And, and, and that's why Thaksin became so popular, because he recognized that. I mean, maybe he used it in, in um, you know, not so... What would you what do you call it? I mean, he he didn't he didn't exercise his power in the right way, but that is still an issue that that anybody who comes into power must tackle still. Yeah, I, I do. I I really very strongly agree with that. I think that what Taksin did was to instill in the peop in the people the ordinary people that they are citizens, that they have entitlements, that they are not they don't have to rely on handouts or on um, presence uh, from the elites um, and this kind of um, political awakening is hard to rein in in the future and I think this is what the powers that be in Thailand did not recognize that they can't with this kind of rather let's say primitive reconciliation or harmony policies um, control anymore but you know th there's almost like invariably you see this this situation going to to a loggerheads in in the future I don't know what time we talk about but do you see any possibility it almost seems that people are afraid of the change because you said it's it's insecure no one knows what it will be replaced with but is there a way you know to come to a situation where this necessary change has can be made and is in, in a safer way if you like um, <clears throat> historically, changes came when um, the economy was really, really bad. So in a way, we are sort of experiencing that right now. Um, although the government paints this picture like, you know, the, the economy has improved. Um, but what that means really is, econ is the um, tourist, tourism business, which is always good in Thailand anyway. And they use that as a kind of propaganda to tell people that, oh, everything is really going well. Um, but people are getting poorer. There are more unemployment now. So I think the turning point will happen when, unfortunately, when the economy is just beyond, you know, beyond help. So we have to see. But I, I hope it doesn't get to that point. But that's what happened in, in the late 90s with the uh, Asian ec economic crisis. Um, that also was a big turning point 
for Thai people because they started to recognize the power structure within the society and they started to learn how that happened and why their lives were suddenly in such bad shape. Um, and in many ways, the situation, the political situation in Thailand now is a result of that crisis. So it's, we have to see, but I don't know. Thanks. And let's go back to your fears uh, after this kind of change uh, in Malaysia. I mean, the, this un very unlikely couple of Mahathir and Anwar are now there <laughs> to uh, change the situation. I mean, in, I think it was in uh, 19... It was, let's say, um, Mahathir who changed the laws, who made uh, Islam a predominant force, uh, institutionalized it at the government level, um, brought actually Anwar in um, to be his, at the beginning, poster boy to, uh, to do that. So they basically created the problems, these religious problems, the dominance of Islam in, in, in society, in political society, um, to a degree that it's hard to believe that they can now return or even reform that system. And with Anwar, I think it's also um, very questionable what his stance is as a, as a Democrat, um, and I'd like to have your thoughts on, on that a little bit. Anwar's wife is the deputy prime minister. Um, and, you know, she keeps saying that she's not his mouthpiece, but I, I believe that she is. Um, Anwar is an Islamist. He always has been and he always will be. Um, you know, with Abim in the Ankatan Bulia Islam Malaysia in the 70s, he started the Dakwa movement. Sorry, the Dakwa movement, which is why women wear the tudong in Malaysia. And that stance is, hasn't really changed. Um, he comes across as a liberal, you know, in some ways. He's very well read. You know, he talks about freedom and unfreedom. You know, he was in, in and out of jail for, for 10 years. Um, he read a great deal. You know, he quotes from, from Shakespeare. Um, he reads philosophy. So on one sense, you know, he, you get the sense that this is an educated man who's very, very aware of, of how important literature and philosophy is. And he, the first thing he said when he came out of jail was that we are, Malaysia will now, fa we are now ready for a golden era. This is going to be our time. Yes, but you have to give us the opportunities to be able to speak and to write and to make films and to, you know, to be able to, because, you know, being an artist in Malaysia has been very, very hard. It's even harder if you're Muslim and Malay Because there's only so much you can say. Those parameters are still around religion. They will always be there. That they, you know, they have become the sort of guardians of, of what can be said, what can't be said. And there is fear. I mean, you know, we thought that, you know, Mahadev was bad in his time. But now with these with these acts and and the fact that you know they're clamping down on the LGBT community, they're clamping down on, on sexuality and you know who you can have sex with and who you can't have sex with, and you know 11 year olds getting married to 43 year old men is fine, but two women who are in love, you know, trying to express that kind of love is not allowed. Um, Mahade did say four days after this public caning that this is not Islam, this is inhumane. Um, but then you know. Um, um, Juan Aziza, who is, who is the, you know, our first deputy prime minister, and Anwar's wife said, if you're gay, stay in the closet. You know, keep it to yourselves. Don't glamorize this, this lifestyle. So it's now the, the kind of moral policing of who we should be. And it's all around religion. It is all around Islam. What is Islam? What kind of Islam um, Malays should practice? It's very worrying because, you know, it's, it's what next? You know, public stonings, you know, are we going to head towards the becoming a Taliban state? Um, and, you know, forget about freedom of expression because it's, it's that very, very strange time now where, you know, Facebook has become such a public forum for anyone and everyone to say anything. So it's like this has opened a Pandora's box where people who couldn't say anything before now feel that they have the right, they have the privilege and the freedom to say whatever they want. And this is now becoming that, that kind of, you know, all the fractures in, in, in Malaysian society, those who were repressed and didn't dare, dare say that, oh, my best friend is gay, but, you know, I, I, I have a problem with that. Um, and now they can actually say that. I do have a problem with the fact that you're gay and that you're Muslim and you should be rehabilitated. So the conversations are now around religion, morality, freedom of speech, so much freedom to say whatever you want to say that it has now become a problem. You know, um, 
a month ago, there was a, an exhibition of 28 Malaysians at the Georgetown Festival. Um, I was part of that exhibition. There were, there were two gay activists. Uh, one is a transgender activist, the other is an LGBT activist. There was an order that came directly from the PM's office to have those two portraits removed. The festival director removed those portraits. I don't know why he did that, um, but he did anyway, and it just created a huge backlash. Of course, it went viral again, picked up by The Guardian, the BBC. Um, one of them is my co-curator for the festival, Panky Tech. He's now the poster boy for LGBT rights in Malaysia, and he's getting death threats on Facebook. So it's, it's, it's such a contradiction because we don't know where it's gonna stop, but the fact that it came from the PM's office you know, there is a guy there who manages only Islamic affairs. So he's the, the Islamic advisor to the prime minister. Um, so you have these things, you know, gay bars being raided. Um, and this never happened before. You know, the concerted, blatant, outright attacks on the LGBT community. A transgender woman was almost beaten to death um, a month ago. Because everyone feels now that they have a right I can say what I want, I can do what I want um, in this, you know, in this new Malaysia, Malaysia Baru. I don't know, I don't know, it's very worrying. But it is, I really feel it's like a Pandora's box that's been opened and now it's free for all. Anybody can say and do whatever they want. Let, let me play the, the devil's advocate and uh, also heavily speculate. I mean, you have this situation where a government changed dramatically. The cards now have changed Totally. So it's a totally new ball game. Now you see that um, demands are being made towards the government. Civil society is getting um, um, very direct in asking the government to change all sorts of things to secure democracy in the country. And then you see that the new government gives in because in fear of the new of the conservative, the religious right to say, okay, maybe if we have on Soji rights and the rights of uh, sexual minorities, if we have to pay that price, you know, to show to the right, to the Muslim conservative part of society that we are not the basically uh, the... Um, implementers of a, of a Chinese policy in this country, w w the allegations are arising on that, and the fear against this right is there. Is that a price too high to pay, or um, do you think that this would open the floodgates for a, a total change of this of the of these opening policies in the future? This is a very difficult question. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really... <laughs> I'm speaking, as you said earlier, as a citizen of my country, um, not as a pol political you know, commentator. Um, I really don't know. I really don't know. I work in the arts, and you know, there, there are things that, of course, need to be said. But again, now it's like we're, we're now living in a climate of fear again. You know? And it's a very open, blatant kind of fear. Um, so I really don't know. It's, it's you know, like, again, you know, we have an attorney, an AG, who, Tommy Thomas, who is, who is who's not Malay. Uh, our Minister of Finance is, is Chinese. Um, so I think there are things that are, that are many steps forward. But then again, on the other hand, we're, it's like we're in the dark ages. You know, it's a kind of inquisition. It's a witch hunt. You know, if, you're, if, if, you, if you display certain kind of attributes, and if you're Muslim, like you're in trouble. You're in serious trouble. Um, and you know, the, the flogging, the public flogging of these two women is the most degrading thing, form of punishment we have ever had in our history. Ever had. It shocked everyone to the core. It, it, they actually went ahead and did it. They did it. And there's this guy describing the fact that we didn't break the skin, it was humane enough, you know, um, and then now you have other states like Pahang who are, who are thinking maybe we should do this too. So it's, it's starting to, you know, it's, it's a, a different kind of ball that's starting to roll down the hill or up the hill. I don't know. It's, it's um, I really don't know. And it, 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 it the, the confounding silence from the politicians we voted in, you know, so many of them didn't say anything. 99.9% .9 did not say a word about this. Actually, I was there on the day, by coincidence, when it was implemented, uh, the sentence, and I was talking um, uh, to people uh, like Latifa from Lawyers for Liberty, and I could really see that people were deeply shocked about it because 
it's not only, I mean, caning has always been a problem. It's it's torture and it's been widely used in uh, Malaysian uh, judicial system. I've been working with Cambodian fishermen to return them from, from uh, when they jumped ship in, in Sarawak and Sabah. And they were routinely caned uh, as part of the sentencing, which was an outrage. But also in, in, in juristic terms, I think it was uh, a massive change in things because normally the caning happened within a sentence, within a confinement and against male that, that is now happening as a sort of public shaming uh, with people around is a totally new dimension. Uh, I totally agree with you. It was live streamed. It was live streamed. I mean, there were people who were. I mean, that is just obscene. I mean, it's 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 a, it's a it's obscene. It's sick, you know. And the fact that people were taking pleasure looking at these two women being caned. It's it's a it's a it's a different kind of low. Um, but again, all in the name of Islam all in the name of Islam and all in the name of being Malay and what it means to be Malay. Susah jadi Melayu, betul. You know, it's difficult to be Malay. It really is. And uh, if you look in the future, I mean, it's looking in a glass bowl, it's, it's always very difficult. But apart from these really atrocious things that are happening now in under the watch, under the silent watch uh, of this new government, do you see other pitfalls, other dangers for this coalition to fail? Uh, in the near future or in the far future? It's a weird mix, you know. I mean, we have a 93-year-old um, um, part leading this, this coalition. Uh, his party actually had the least votes. Pakatan had the highest votes. So Anwar Ibrahim is the de facto leader of, 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 of Harapan. Um, I don't know. I really, again, it's, it's we're in, in untried, untested territory. I mean, the fact that we, you know, achieved this kind of bloodless revolution, we have a completely new government that it is kind of old as well. We've got new people who are, you know, some of them who are in complete awe of Mahathir. Um, you know, there is a large segment of Malaysian society who, who believed in his views. You know, now, now that he's saying, we look east, we look towards Japan, you know, we will negotiate with China, we're getting rid of contracts that Najib um, uh, uh, started and didn't complete. You know, he's hauled up Najib and his wife, they've been charged. You know, so there are things, and he keeps saying rule of law, rule of law, rule of law. Um, but at the same time, when it comes to, to pass, to, to the Islamic party, um, I don't know where he stands, really. I really don't know where he stands. With Anwar, it's going to be even harder because Anwar is an Islamist. He always has been. And if he is going to come into power and say, you know, we want a golden age, what exactly does that mean? I, I have no idea what that means. Does it mean a new age of Islam? Does it mean a new age of freedom of speech where arts and literature are celebrated? Where we can speak about philosophy openly. I don't know. I really don't know. Thanks. Um, so if you look into the glass bowl, <laughs> now what uh, what do you expect now? It's it's always hard, but I think it's good to l a bit a bit forward looking to read the signals as we stand today. Um, four years of uh, military government with all its repression, with all its um, also killing off of institutions, um, with its. I mean, this is the longest serving uh, junta since the days of Sarit. Um, which is quite impressive if you look at the time frame. You know, in, in, in its high history, in the history of the coups, the handover has been becoming quicker and quicker. What we see now is a total reversal of that. So it seems that the military is in there for the long run. And from the constitution, when you look at all these, the essence of the constitution, it basically shows that they are there for the long run. Do you see a way out of that? Is there a possibility? Now, parties are getting registered in Thailand. There's the Future Forward Party. There are other parties, the commoners, uh, that have quite, um, let's say, liberal democratic ideas. Do you see a chance for them to change this situation and get out of these doldrums? Um, no. <laughs> um, I, I think it would be very hard for changes to happen from within. Um, and also, I think is, you know, the coming into power of Curlin, uh, the current government coincided with the passing of uh, our previous king, uh, King Rama IX. And I think the main objective of this taking over of the, of the power was really to be in power after the passing of the king. So 
it's very obvious that they are trying to do that uh, in any way they can. They might hold an election, there might be an election, but they are still trying to influence the election. They're still trying to, um, you know, use whoever will be the next government as puppets uh, for their for their power. So I don't I don't really. I mean, unfortunately, I feel like if Thailand would change drastically, it would involve some really huge um, situation where it might not be pleasant for people to to think about or to admit, you know. And even so, even if something like that happened, if there was uh, violence, um, I don't even know that the outcome of that uh, violence would be better or it would would be an improvement of what's already there. Um, so it's, it's a really tough um, future to foresee. But, but I think I do have uh, some hopes in um, people. I mean, in the way that things have changed within society in general, in, uh, in culture. Um, a lot of people... Um, well, I mean, we of course we learn from from outside influences. We see what's happening in the world. It's now very easy to um, to educate ourselves about what's going on around us. Um, and a lot of people, I think, are learning uh, in that way. And also, we are looking back uh, to our history. A lot of people in literature, for example, are writing about uh, Thai political history. Um, academics are now quite popular. Uh, when there are talks and when there are panel discussions, a lot of people show up. Um, young people are becoming more socially aware, um, not only in the political issues, but in other issues in society as well. So there is a kind of um, optimism in that. Uh, but in terms of the people in power giving people, democracy, real democracy, or more freedom of speech, I don't see that in, in any near future. I mean, there's a lot we don't have the time to talk about. I wanted to talk, we forgot about to talk about Bessie, the the um, role of civil society at large in, in Malaysia and in Thailand. We didn't talk about the social media that much, but, um, well, we can't cover all. But I, what I didn't want to miss actually was um, in a, a sort of a conversation between the two of you uh, to talk about the role of literature, um, the role of writers and authors in fomenting change in societies. Also, I think, uh, Bernice, you were telling me, you know, we have a problem, we don't read each other. If we talk about ASEAN... Uh, we don't know each other, we don't read each other, we don't even translate our books in the respective language uh, of each other. Um, a very interesting point. Maybe you can discuss that a little bit between the two of you. Uh, I, I would really appreciate that too, because we have you here also as authors to, to uh, get your thoughts on, on this situation, on this front. Yeah, translation is, is a huge issue. Well, it's a non-issue because it doesn't happen, you know. Um, uh, but yes, we don't, we're don't. we not reading each other. I mean, Prabhdaal's books are now finally in English, so I can actually read you. But uh, Michelle Barang was, was, I think, the only uh, person who was, who was beginning to translate uh, Thai literature, and he's now a very, a very old man. But we have, we, are, we have similar traumas. You know, Southeast Asia, you know, I was talking earlier about there is a very distinct Southeast Asian culture, and, and you know, my dear friend Farish Noor says that he calls, himself, he, he calls himself a Southeast Asianist, and I am very much inclined to, to say the same. We are a very volatile region. There are t 10 countries, you know, failed nation states at various stages, you know, largely authoritarian governments, um, but we all have things in common, common trauma common, uh, you know, colonialization. There, there are similarities in food, in culture, in dance, in music, literature, yes. But we're not reading each other because it's... I don't know why. I, I really don't know why. And in, in my literary festival, um, we've been trying to, now for the second year, to try to create a translator's roundtable to create a model that works for Southeast Asia in terms of translation so that we finally get to read each other. We read the folk tales, we read the children's tales, we read the, the, the epics and the hikayats and all of that. Um, 
but it's it's going to take a lot of work, and I think it's it's also the kind of commitment that we need to make to each other as as a region, as as in in, in spite of the volatility that that we have. Um, in Malaysia, language is very very political. Um, whether you write in English or Malay or Chinese or Tamil, it, it's very political. Especially so if you are uh, a very popular writer and and uh, if you if you write about Islam, if you write about sexuality, uh, Faisal Tehrani is a he has, all of his books have been banned. Um, and he writes about Islam and sexuality. So books do get banned um, because he writes in Malay and because it reaches a larger audience. I write in English. I do write poetry in Malay sometimes, mostly love poetry because Malay is a beautiful language. But it's safer to write in English. On, you know, on that note, my last novel, uh, my last book, uh, uh, my first novel, um, is set during the Reformasi period. And it tackles all the things you're not supposed to tackle about. So race, religion, sex, uh, race, religion, sex, politics. Yes, you're not supposed to write about any of this. I, I wrote it and uh, nobody in Malaysia would publish it. So I went south and I went to Singapore. Epigram Books is my publisher. Um, he's a man who likes to take risks. They said yes. Um, and we printed two different covers, one for Singapore, one for Malaysia. The Malaysian version has a disclaimer on the cover which says, for mature readers only. <laughs> because, um, yes, I know I'm not, it's, it's not a laughing matter because it, it's very serious because otherwise the bookshops would not have taken it. Because in Malaysia, if, if somebody makes all, we have the Sedition Act, all it takes is one person to make a complaint about anything in a book, and then a police investigation is started, and then, you know, the ball starts rolling. But at the same time, they don't go after the writer or the publisher. They go after the bookshop. They go after the bookshop. So a few years ago, Ishad Manji, who is um, Canadian, lesbian, Muslim, wrote this book called Allah, um, Allah Freedom and Love. It was translated into Malay. We had the book launch. Special branch was downstairs waiting. She had to be rushed out of, you know, out of the country. And they went after, the relig religious authorities went after the manager of a Borders bookshop and eventually the publisher. That case is still ongoing. It's been five years, five years. So bookshops are afraid. Publishers are afraid. Again, it has to do with Islam and the freedom of Islam, and the freedom to love, who you want to love in Islam. So it is a problem. Um, but what's the reason they don't go after the, the authors? Well, she was Canadian. She was Canadian. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Um, So they went after the... So no, they but would, the, but so in they would order, go after you. If, <laughs> sorry? If they would go after you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the book has been out for a year now. Nothing's happened so far, but there's, there's a lot... And I'm surprised. <laughs> don't! <laughs> Um, and that many mature readers. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. So um, yeah, you know, because she wasn't Malaysian, so they went after the publisher um, and the bookstore manager and charged. You know, they wanted to put her in jail for selling this book, for having it on the shelf, a book about love, Islam, and freedom, you know? So hence the disclaimer. Um, so language is political. What you write about is very political. You know, we have a tradition of banning books. As I said, Mein Kampf is available in Kinokuniya, but, but um, the origin of the species by Charles Darwin isn't. So again, we have, we have this very strange um, culture where certain books are allowed and certain books aren't. Um, in terms of, you know, because I work with, 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 with the literary arts, I teach creative writing at the University of Nottingham. Um, the spaces for writing and publishing in English are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And this is a very worrying thing for me. And as an educator, I feel that a whole generation of writers and poets in Malaysia are just not going to be read and heard because nobody wants to publish poetry. Nobody wants to publish novels in English because they don't sell. Because the Malay reading market is huge. I mean, some writers sell up to like 40,000 copies of books. And that, that's, that's, you know, they don't even need to get published, uh, translated. So there's this huge disparity. We have Chinese writers who are superstars in Taiwan. You know, it's a completely different kind of, of culture, defined by language, defined by what you write. And this is a very, very um, huge concern for me. Um, well, Thailand is, the situation is a little bit different because we don't have, uh, like people, writers, Thai writers usually write in Thai. There are very few 
writers who write in English and Thai or or in English, um, and that is kind. Of, I mean, the Thai market is quite small, also. So the literary community is really small. Um, most of us know each other, uh, one way or another, and um, and we seem to be reading ourselves. I mean, we we're reading we're reading each other, um, and we're talking about our books. But the general public um, don't seem to give much att much attention to to Thai li literary the Thai literary scene. That also includes the authority who probably doesn't read anyway. Um, <laughs> but but to them, we are sort of this, we are kind of like itches. We are it's just small irritation um, that don't really matter so much. It used to be quite different in the past uh, when um, in the beginning of democracy, a lot of Thai writers were influential in bringing on the idea of democracy. Um, Writers would get jailed. Uh, they would be. They have to go outside of the country for exile. Now, nowadays, it's mostly academics who have to flee the country. Um, yeah, I mean, sadly, I think uh, writers have not really advanced in that sense. They don't lead the political um, um, movements or anything like that anymore. Uh, and it might have something to do with the trends in literature that happened in this 80s and 90s that were based mostly on you know very in individualistic uh, view view point of the world and things like that and reflection of life or mostly urban lifestyle uh, we get a lot of influence from the west mostly some influence from japan but not that much um, so the writers, or young writers, tend to want to write um, like American writers, or uh, or maybe South American. Uh, exactly. Can I can I just yeah, comment yeah, on yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you write really weird stuff. Right. And <laughs> and your films you. are weird. You know, and this is and, says a woman for and mature is, only. Sorry. Says a woman for mature only. <laughs> But I mean, the Thai sentiment, I mean, you look at your commercials. I mean, have any of you seen Thai commercials? There's a dinosaur wearing braces, you know, and things like that. You know, and that, that's, a, that's an ad for, for toothpaste. Um, there is a very distinct sense of, of surrealism in, in your writing, in your art, in your filmmaking. Um, I mean, you know, like Un Uncle Bumi is, is such a bizarre film, you know, and I think... You, you do that because, and that's a way of circumventing certain things. And that's, it, it's a very distinct way of, of looking at the world and writing from the world and writing from a Thai point of view. Um, it's very unique. We don't do that. Singapore doesn't do that. Indonesia does it to a certain extent. I think Eka's book sort of, you know, verges upon that. But I think in looking at trauma and in looking and in, in in looking at the the dictatorships that we have to live under, I think as writers, this is the challenge. How do we write about the world that we live in without getting into trouble? But also, you know points across. Yes, yeah. that's right. That's right. But in 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 your work and in a lot of work of great Thai writers and artists, there is that sense of surrealism, um, which is a, a sort of a familiarity that exists within within your culture, and I think that's you know it's it's a it's a very unique t thing to have. Um, in my case, I think I'm just weird. I mean, <laughs> I, I I I don't think it has not that much to do with being a Thai writer because I was away from Thailand for a long time, yeah. um, and I was influenced directly uh, by Western culture. So I don't think f in for me it's maybe not so strange that I write <laughs> or, or make films like that. But, um, but in terms of Thai art in Thailand, um, I think there is a sense of denial mixed with frustration. Kind of like maybe we've been watching things on Plato's cave wall of Plato's cave for too long. And um, the frustration builds up, and we don't know how to express. I mean, and also it has to do with the trends, as I said. Like now, if you if you write a straightforward political novel, mm. you will get ridiculed. You know, people will say, "No, it's old-fashioned." 
you know. So it has a lot to do with caring too much about what's being what's trendy in the West, what's accepted as great literature, you know. Um, and that is not, I don't think it's healthy for, for a country like Thailand. We still need people to write very straightforward, powerful political fiction. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's, it's not a job for me <laughs> because I can't, I don't have the talent for it. That's why I write sci-fi because yeah, <laughs> I have yeah. to escape. Yeah, 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 you do like aliens, don't you? <laughs> So thank you very much. I, I have to say I'm supposed to talk politics, but I like the, the last part the most. Um, now we've reached, oh, it's more than an hour. So, um, I mean, we couldn't straddle all that, that was for sure. But I also want to, to give the guests uh, the chance to ask uh, um, the writers, our two guests, uh, questions. Uh, if you like, please um, feel free. <coughs> just uh, maybe just introduce yourself and um, ask your question. Uh, English or Deutsch? <laughs> In English, maybe. Yeah? Egal. Yeah, okay. English, uh, Detlef Mercer, my name. I was uh, astonished at uh, talking to you, the Thai guy. <laughs> I was, uh, it, it has been more than 10 years ago. I've, it was by coincidence, I, saw, I went to a book fair in Thailand, national book fair, it was very crowded. It was many, several days over, maybe a week. And it, uh, I, I saw a lot of Thai people who were very interested in Thai literature. And there were even, not, not uh, very much, there, but there were uh, uh, enough uh, English, title, uh, English uh, uh, literature written by Thai people also. So that's not quite true what you said, I guess. Or maybe I'm wrong, uh, but that's my uh, uh, impression. But it's been a long time ago. Maybe today it's different. I don't know. No, it is true that the book fairs, we have two book fairs a year. Um, and it is true that they're very popular. Millions of people come, mostly young people. Um, but that is, I mean, it's good for the publishers to have that space. And for a lot of independent publishers, that's where they get their income, their, their money for to be able to print new books for the next year or whatever. But, um, but in my opinion, I also go to the book fair. I also have a booth there. Uh, but it's not really good for the system, for the ecosystem of uh, book industry as a whole, because um, the bookshops are doing really badly. Uh, many of them have closed down. Even the um, um, chain bookstores are doing bad. So people are sort of waiting to go to the book fairs to buy books because they get discounts and because new releases uh, come out during the book fair. So th the book fairs are very, very popular, but they've sort of become the only events for people to go and buy books. And um, the reason why a lot of kids go to the book fair is because books are like it's almost the only thing that parents give the kids money to buy because they have this image that it's something good for them to have. Um, so they have, every time there's a book fair, the parents give their children budget to, like book budget to go to the book fair and buy books. Uh, so it's, it's very imp impressive if you go there and you see it's very crowded and it's huge. It's in a big convention hall. Um, but overall, for the ecosystem, it's not really that good. Thank you very much. My name is Shachar Shoham. Um, I wanted to ask um, about Thailand. You, you mentioned a little bit of Isan, right, the northeast. And, and I wanted to ask a little bit about the role of urbanization and the centralization of Bangkok in everything that you describe regarding art, literature. Uh, you mentioned it in regarding of the politicization and the role they play, but what, what else besides that? I mean, what, what's happening outside of Bangkok regarding all the, all the things you talk about? You mean uh, specifically the Isan area or? Well, I'm interested in Isan, but I, 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 okay. I'm a, I, Whatever you want to look at. Um, well, Thailand is still a very centralized uh, place. And 
obviously all the jobs are in Bangkok. But Chiang Mai is well known as a cultural hub. A lot of young Thai creatives have moved from Bangkok to Chiang Mai, and there is uh, there are some new galleries and uh, new um, exciting museum, art museum there. Um, and there is a strong artistic community there as well. And Isan is now growing in this uh, in the creative field. There uh, um, there are more and more Isan writers um, producing interesting works with connection to the political situation because uh, Isan people were the most affected in the crackdown, you know. Um, yeah, and so still a big problem because everything is in Bangkok, um, but I think it's now slowly spreading because urbanization is also spreading and because of the internet, um, people can now be able to go back home uh, and live there if they can find work or if they are content with living with the family or whatever. So now we, f we find, especially artists, because it's difficult to, to make a living in Bangkok anyway, um, they go home uh, or they try to start something in their hometown, uh, but still being able to communicate uh, through internet. So, I mean, I think it's getting better in that sense. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask something to Bernice. Uh, first of all, of course, congratulations that uh, you succeeded uh, at this big change in Malaysia. Um, but I'm also worried what you were telling about the latest uh, development. Um, what I'm interested in is um, obviously in the elections, you were unified, all the different uh, uh, ethnic groups in Malaysia. So how is it now? How is it perceived, all the changes that are happening and the, obviously the focus on Islam, the, the more focused focus on Islam? Um, Malaysia is, you know, we have East Malaysia and we have um, Malaysian Borneo, which is Sabah and Sarawak. And the issues that, that we have in West Malaysia are very different from the issues that, that are present in, in East Malaysia, Sabah and Sarawak. There are multiple tribes, multiple languages. There are hardly any Malays there, so the issue of being Islam and Muslim does not even exist there. It's all very much in the West, um, in West Malaysia. Um, I think there, there are, the fractures that were already there are now showing again. Um, we were united for a very brief moment, but now I think we can see that, that these fractures are still there. Of course they are, you know, and, and it's the politicians who, who use this, who try to keep themselves in power and how to keep Malaysians subjugated, repressed. Um, you know, we, we have this... What does it mean to be Malaysian? You know, Malaysia, what, you know, this is, the, again, the basic question. What, what does it mean to be Malaysian? Why do we have to tick the race, Malay, Chinese, Indian, other? You know, why can't we just be Malaysian? Um, so race divides us, religion divides us, class divides us. There is a growing disparity between the rich and the poor. And, you know, it, it has become customary for very poor Malay families uh, who have many children to send their sons to tahfiz schools to madrasas, where all they do is learn the Quran. That's all they do. They memorize it from beginning to end, from morning till night. I mean, and this is worrying. This is not the Malaysia I grew up with. This is not the kind of Malay I grew up with. This is not the kind of Malay person I grew up with. Um, English, the standard of English has deteriorated hugely. So again, it's, it's, it's divisions of, of now class. Um, poverty is a very, very big issue. You, you know, it, the Twin Towers are right there, 20 minutes away, you have children and families who are starving. You know, it's again, and this is why, one of the reasons why the Najib government fell, because people were just, uh, we were just disgusted by the kind of wealth they had. Um, so these fractures are there, and again, it's like I, you know, I've said over and over again, I'm very concerned. I'm very concerned because Malaysia has such potential we do. It is one of the great nations which has embraced, you know, globalization. We are very modern. Um, we have the potential to become a great nation because we have what it takes. It's just whether or not, and the fact that we, we showed the world that we could do it. We came together as a people, 
not Malay, Chinese, Indian, other, we came together as Malaysians to vote out a corrupt government. We did it. Now the challenge also lies on us. It's not just up to the politicians anymore. It's up to us how we behave in the public sphere, in the private sphere, how we treat other Malaysians, um, regardless of race um, or religion. But the predominant fear, and then that this is still a cloud that hangs over us, is, is Islam. What kind of role will it have in this new Malaysia, in this Malaysia Baru? I don't know. I don't have the answer to that question yet. You here? You have a question? Um, thank you. Um, I actually have two questions myself. <laughs> I hope that's all right. Um, yeah, I'm Julia. I'm working here with HBS, and I had the pleasure to already spend some time with our authors. Um, I was wondering, you know, what you spoke about earlier, this people feeling that they, like they can say whatever they want to, even if it's harming other people. I mean, that's happening here as well. I mean, we had the riots. We had people actually not only on social media, but physically hunting people down because they were perceived as foreigners. And I was wondering, how much do you read about what is happening here in Southeast Asia? Is there any news about it at all? And how is it perceived? And the qu second question I have is, um, I read your book, Bernice, and I loved it so much, although I was traumatized a little for a few <laughs> days. Um, but what impressed me a lot in the novel was um, how you wrote about being a woman without being explicit about it. So finding one's, like for me, it was not the main theme of the novel, but like this struggle to find one's place between activism, job, being a daughter, being a mother then in the end, of course. Um, so you spoke about how like ethnicity and class influences a lot of the literature, but how do you feel being a woman influenced it in the li literature scene? That's, that's your question, right? Okay. <laughs> um, um, thank you for reading the novel. Yes, it's, uh, it's particularly traumatizing for women with young children. Um, I've... I'm, I'm half Chinese and half Punjabi, and you know I grew up very, very confused. I didn't like my name. Um, I was teased in school. I, I, you know, didn't like school. I daydreamed my way through school, and I found refuge in in writing and literature. Um, a lot of my writing came from grief. I lost my father very tragically when I was four years old, um, and that sense of eviction. And I write about this in in my memoir. That sense of eviction cast me outside the world. I had to write myself back into the world. And as a Malaysian woman, as an Asian woman, I've always used writing as a form of expression. Um, a lot of things I write about are very taboo. I, I write about very personal things in my poetry, and I've been accused of, of being hysterical and mad and, and you know, overtly personal, confessional poet, whatever. But um, You know, as a woman in Malaysia, you know, there is always the male gaze. You're always still fighting in the 21st century about what it means to be a, a contemporary woman in Asia. Um, you know, um, if you look at the, the, the film Crazy Rich, you can't say Asians here, right? So the film in Germany is Crazy Rich. There's no Asians, um, which I find very strange because it's, it's too, too sensitive. Did you know that? You didn't know that? And, and how the women are portrayed... Um, in the film, you know, you're, you're looking at a very largely Chinese, very wealthy uh, Singaporean community. Um, and these women are, are represented in a, in a particular way, which is fine. It's a Hollywood film, you know, but then there's so much debate about, about how women should be represented and this debate about why there are no brown Asians in it and so on and so forth. I mean, you can go on and on and on about this, but what I'm, what I'm saying is, as an Asian woman, there are so many taboos still that you can't write about. Um, and writing about you know, motherhood was one of the themes that I explored in the novel. And nobody writes about motherhood. Nobody writes about this. Nobody writes about the menopause. Um, why? Because it's, it's difficult. It's confrontational. Um, and it's because nobody expects you to. You know, just write about simple things. Write about basic everyday things, um, write genre, write noir, write detective fiction, write chiclet, you know? Um, but 
you know, I, I am a very political person. I love my country very much. I, I think we have so much potential. I teach um, young people all the time, and there's so much potential. And the first thing I, I tell them is that, you know, I can't teach you, but you can learn. You can learn to find that voice. You can learn to explore that voice. And if you're not going to write that story, no one else is. You have to do it for yourself. So that's essentially it. If we need to write Malaysian stories, we have to be, we have to be doing it ourselves. We can't expect others to do it for us. Yeah, the other question I think you have whether, <laughs> there, was whether there has question. been... You, you were asking, Yuya, whether there has been... Uh, or the, yeah. the others took note of the events in Germany, whether there's a f uh, feedback? In Thailand, unfortunately, no. A lot of um, international news now is focused on Trump, which is, or, or China. Mm, so it's sadly, no, we don't know much about what's going on here. All right, thank you. Um, my question would be about Malaysia as well, and uh, especially about uh, the fragmentation, because um, you were saying that a lot of cultures live there, people are coming from many uh, different backgrounds, not even speaking the same language many times. So um, especially about the theme of diversity, because in the West, for example, diversity is all, um, many times referred as, as a strength of a community, but you are um, talking about the, the challenges uh, which come with it, and especially talking about public sphere. So my question actually is, are there any kind of platforms or something where you see people from different cultures actually talking to each other finding some kind of some kind of um, yes common ground which uh, would probably be some be something very very um, yeah pro uh, progressive and um, this is what I wanted to ask you about like are there any kind of cultural uh, movements with not just within one culture but um, yeah as some kind of uh, Malayan group um, we have a, a sort of, there's a renaissance um, happening in, in the art movement. Uh, there are a lot of young people who are taking it upon themselves to create art that is very, very provocative. Um, we, have, we have now in KL, um, there's, there's an art space called the Zongsan Building, which was a building in the 60s, which has now been reclaimed by artists, all doing different things. Uh, selling records, making t-shirts, um, presenting talks by academics and people who are coming through. So this is a platform where, where we see young, educated Malaysians coming together. Um, it happens in the cities. Georgetown it has become a cultural hub as well because of the festivals um, that, that, it, that it hosts. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, so it's the perfect venue for a lot of, a lot of cultural activities. Um, but these conversations need to be created. You're not going to, these platforms need to be created because, you know, young people, again, deal with a lot of class and race issues, uh, divides. So I think there are, there are a lot of initiatives. Um, um, there are a lot of NGOs that go into the countryside as well to work with young, young, uh, young women. Um, so there are platforms, yes. To answer your question, yes, there are. There are, definitely. And, and, and it's growing because um, people want to be expressive. They are not reliant on, um, on sponsorships or government funds that support, not that we have government funds that support the arts. We don't have any, even have an arts council. Um, but one thing I can say that, that we are very resilient. We have become very, very stubborn, very, very thick-skinned. We know devious ways of finding money. Um, and we, we make use of it, we stretch it. We, um, there are some very, very exciting things happening in KL at the moment and in Penang and in Johor as well, which is in the south and in Sabah. So yes, I, yes there are platforms that are, that are happening and um, very exciting things are coming out of it. Maybe we wrap it up then with you with the last question then. Hi, Bernice. Uh, my name is Raj and I'm from Malaysia. You mentioned about the art sector, the free, uh, how writers and poets may go, a generation of writers and poets may go unheard. Uh, do you think this would become worse in times to come? or And do you think that we could do something to kind of increase or awareness on the art? Because I think that the theatre field has been having ups and downs recently. Do you think we can do something about it? Well, what we need is, you know, more publishers who are not so concerned about making money, really. You know, if you look at Singapore, Singapore is heavily subsidized by the arts. The National Arts Council gives out grants to publishers, you know, filmmakers, you know, 
all, all specter of, of genre and medium and form to make art. Um, if you're in Singapore, you throw a stone and you'll hit a poet. There's so many poets in Singapore. It's unbelievable because the system supports it. There is infrastructure that supports it. Nobody wants to publish poetry in Malaysia. Why? Because it doesn't sell. So therefore, we have no poets. We have spoken word poets who are very good, but poets who work on the page are kind of like, you know, there and not there. So a lot of my students, some of them who are really, really, really good, I tell them to go to Singapore. You know, find a publisher in Singapore. If you're really good, if someone in the UK picks you up. So we basically, to, ask, to answer your question is, we need to have a greater awareness of the importance of writing in English in literature. And it's not so much about the selling or the business aspect of book selling, which is, which is unfortunately um, a business. It, you know, you have to sell books. But again, you know, to, to sort of connect both your questions, there are platforms that are being created, spoken word events where hundreds of kids show up. Um, we are organizing the first national poetry slam and it's open to, to English and Bahasa. Um, yeah, but it's, it's basically having platforms like publishers who believe in the value of Malaysian literature and who are concerned in the, with the future of, of, of literature because a lot of the work that is being produced now is not literature. It is genre work. It is fantasy. Not that I have anything against fantasy or science fiction, um, but a lot of it is noir. It's you know, called slacker lit. I call it slacker lit. One publisher called it disposable fiction. I mean, these are concerns. We need books that are going to last 100 years, 200 years, that people are going to read and, and discover things about Malaysia. It's the best time to be an artist in Malaysia. You need to find ways in which to express yourself, but I just wish that we had the same kind of infrastructure that Singapore does in order to create those platforms and in order to create the poets that we so desperately need. Okay, so before I um, wrap up, maybe Sven, you had an announcement to make uh, for the TAT. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I want to uh, invite you for the Tats Cafe. We will have a discussion on Southeast Asian uh, social media. What uh, political effects does it have for how you deal with fake news and with uh, hate speech? We have uh, journalists as guests. We are, at the moment, we are organizing a workshop with 10 journalists from Cambodia, Malaysia, and uh, Myanmar. So those of you who are interested in Southeast Asia, please come Thursday evening to Tats Cafe. I have a few flyers for you, so you're invited. And thanks for the chance to tell it. Thank you. Uh, Thursday evening, I have a flyer and give it to you. Okay, so uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we wrap up. Um, so I really like to thank the two of you. It was a very interesting evening, especially for me at the interface between politics, but also literature, the insights about Singapore. Uh, when you throw a stone, because last time I was there, I tried to throw a stone. <laughs> I didn't see a single poet there. They were all shopping, but I'll try next time. So um, please give uh, uh, a round of applause to our two guests. Um, <laughs> so and I was also told that downstairs there are some drinks and... Uh, S something to eat, small things, hand food. Okay, so please feel free, go downstairs, mingle and talk. And I guess that you also stay here a little bit for more discussions uh, and more time to talk. Thanks a lot. Thank